And now everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Rob Kroll. Thank you. My name is Rob Kroll. I'm the program director for the business intelligence and internet marketing degrees here at Full Sail University. Thank you all for being here this morning. And I want to give a warm welcome and thank you to our special guest, Ted Murphy, who is the CEO and co-founder of Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah is actually a sponsor of Hall of Fame, so we owe them sp double thanks for him being here and for, for sponsoring this event. <laughs> Um, Ted's been an entrepreneur. He's founded six companies since 1994, and his current company is Isia, and they have um, grown tremendously since they started, and they're right here in Orlando. They every year um, sponsor an event called Isia Fest, which was just last week, and uh, if you're still in Orlando, I encourage you to consider attending that because it's a great event and uh, I'm sure you learn lots of things there. Um, so without further ado, Ted Murphy. Thank you. All right, you guys awake this morning? You got your caffeine? I have my, uh, my Full Sail brand coffee here. Did you guys know that I made that? It's delicious. All right, so who in this room is an aspiring entrepreneur. All right, good, you're in the right room then. This is going to be a little story about my own personal journey. And uh, I'm gonna bring you through the ups and downs uh, because being an entrepreneur can be absolutely awesome, but it can also be really, really hard. So I was born into a family of entrepreneurs. My father owned everything from radio stations to uh, furniture stores, and he took two companies public. My two older brothers both raised over $30 million each from venture capitalists. One of them sold their company to Akamai, which you guys, you guys might know, big streaming company. The other raised $30 million and the company vaporized, gone. So some, some kids grow up and they want to be a fireman or a policeman, but I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I started my first company in high school and I was almost expelled for selling t-shirts to my fellow classmates. When I got to college, I started another company doing graphic design and later full service advertising. I got my first credit card at 18 and I maxed that thing out within six months. And that was so I could buy one computer and one printer because they were so expensive at that time. That, that was a pretty awesome rig though. But because we could only afford one rig, my partner and I would work shifts. So he would work during the day uh, because somehow it made sense at the time that he was older so he would get the better shift. And I would work during the night. So this right here, I don't know if you can see, you have to follow me camera. This was actually a bed that he built that folded down out of the wall and he would sleep right there uh, at night while I was working. So my first year, my salary was $6,000, U.S., <laughs> huge amounts of money. We actually did a lot of work on trade at that time, so if anybody would give us food or beer, we would do the work, and we did a lot of stuff for like local restaurants uh, and bars just to try to build up a portfolio. Within the first couple of years, it was pretty tough, but eventually we started winning national accounts. And in year four, we hired my college professor to come work for us. Uh, so I kind of looked at that and I said, all right, we're, we're definitely doing something right. I became so busy with work that I actually never graduated college. So uh, 
five years into that business, I decided that I was going to move on and sell out my company to my partners and leave that traditional agency. That time we were doing a lot of print, we were doing billboards, we were doing television work, and I started an interactive agency. This was like the M&M phase, so you guys have to understand <laughs> that at the time, this is really cool. Um, so we started building these really uh, big, elaborate online uh, experiences. So our customers were Burger King and Coors and Disney, and we were one of the pioneers of online advert games. Uh, so people could come on and, and play games in Shockwave or Flash, and we got a lot of notoriety for that. I was 23 years old, and the first year of running that business after selling my old business, we did a million dollars in sales. Um, so things were going great. I had awesome hair. And then the dot-com bust. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, pets.com. So a lot of our clients were uh, dot-com companies. We had some companies like you know, Coors and Disney, but um, we had a lot of customers who were, were startups. And I would start to call those companies to try to collect our our uh, payments, collect on the bills, and at first nobody would answer, and then eventually the, num the lines just went dead. It was like they, they never existed. So within six months, all of my dot-com clients went out of business, and that was about 50% of my revenue. That was followed by 9-11. So not only did I lose a significant amount of business from these dot-com clients, now my regular customers were really scared. They did not want to spend any money. So I had built up the company to about 50 people at that time, and I had to lay off half of them. And that was, uh, that was the first time that I had ever been through that, and it was incredibly, incredibly tough for me. And I had recurring nightmares of planes crashing into our office building, uh, and that, that went on for months. Um, it was a really, really dark time. But I never gave up, and eventually the company recovered. And within a few years, uh, we had actually decided that we were going to build our own building. We were growing like mad. Things were going great. It was 2006, and during that time, I had also des decided to invest some of our, I'm sorry, 2005, um, I had decided to invest some of our uh, profits that we were getting into building some proprietary technology. So in 2006, I decided to spin out some IP, uh, leave that agency, and start a new company. I raised $3 million from a VC called Draper Fisher Jurbetson, which is one of the the top tier uh, VCs in Silicon Valley, and uh, launched a new company. Danny boy! Oh, buddy. I'm going to make you so rich, you have no idea. <laughs> um, his exact words were, um, we're going to do it. And if my partners don't want to do it, I'll do it. So that was pretty awesome. That was after I, I had just come out of the VC meeting where they told me that they were going to do my deal. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I was also, I was eating a lot of donuts at the time. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of energy. Um, so I launched a platform called Paper Post. And Paper Post was the first online marketplace to pay bloggers to create content for brands. And this concept at the time, it went over like a fart in church. It did not go over well. Uh, I was absolutely crucified for paying people to blog because at that time, Facebook wasn't selling ads. Uh, you know, 
Twitter and YouTube barely existed, let alone sold ads. And when you ask people about what a blog was, they would say, oh, a blog is like an online diary. Uh, that was before there were really any sort of corporate influences in social media, and people thought that social media was going to be this panacea that would be void of any sort of marketing or, or corporate influence. So here I am, this guy saying, hey, I'm going to pay people to create content, and I got so much backlash for that. So the industry's biggest thought leaders attacked me. They called me an idiot. They called me evil. I'm going to show you a little excerpt of what it was like at that time to go to trade shows and industry events for me. The video we saw earlier today from Paper Post, I found to be appalling. They motivated a mom to turn her kids into shills. I feel like that big trick. It's a corrosive influence. It's corrupting. It makes. It makes the internet worse, not better. He is the most evil person in this. <laughs> That's just rude. That's just being arrogant and kind of an ass. So that guy at the end was Mike Arrington, and you may know that name for, as the guy who started TechCrunch. So within the first year of us launching, we had uh, 11 negative articles posted about us in TechCrunch. And they were just all over us because, again, we were this company that was going to ruin the internet. But now when we look back 10 years later, this idea of sponsored content, this idea of uh, you know, sponsored tweets, which we later introduced, is now commonplace. You guys see it everywhere. You see it in your Facebook feed. You see it in your Twitter feed. You see sponsored posts on the New York Times. You see sponsored posts from the Associated Press. BuzzFeed makes all of their money off of sponsored content. So we were way ahead of our time, and we were really punished for it. We took a lot of arrows in the back, but it didn't mean that we were wrong. So when you fast forward 10 years later, that company that they attacked, that same idiotic idea, we now work with five of the top five global CPG brands around the world. We have 140 employees in two countries, and we listed on NASDAQ last year. The entire process has been crazy. Just absolutely a roller coaster. I've bootstrapped. I've raised money from friends and family. I've even taken this company public. I've raised $58 million in debt and equity, and over half of that has been in the past two years. So with all that money, I've funded a lot of different ideas. Some of those have worked, some of those haven't worked, but 100% of those have been learning moments. Do you guys hear my stomach? <laughs> I have lived the good and the bad of being an entrepreneur. And not, not only have I had my own personal experience, but I've had the pleasure or the misfortune <laughs> of seeing my family members have these huge successes and failures as well. Um, when we were going uh, public last year, or getting listed on NASDAQ last year, my dad... Um, my dad and I had a conversation. My dad's now 75 years old. And um, I'm sorry, sorry, my mom is 75 years old. My dad's 85. Um, and for the first time, he told me the story of what it was like before he took his first company public. And he said, Ted, I want you to know that I was, I was always too proud to tell you this, but the night before we took that company public, I was burning our furniture in the fireplace because I did not have enough money left to, to buy firewood. And uh, my dad's always been a really proud guy. He's always tried to shield his children as much as possible from the, the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. But 
I want you guys to know, you know, if you're going down this path, you might get down to your furniture. You might have to burn it to survive. But if you keep pushing on, you might be able to find that big success. So as an entrepreneur, you live somewhere between doing epic shit and being in an epic shit storm. The highs are higher, but the lows are so much lower. And this is what I call the red line, right in the middle. As an entrepreneur, you live every day on one side of it. And today what I'm gonna share with you are six stories from my own personal entrepreneurial journey and my hope is that in sharing those stories that you spend more time doing epic shit and less time in the epic shit storm. So I've been balanced and I've been unbalanced. I was born with one of these, not one of these. I am either on or I am off. I have no dimmer switch. Most people ask if I ever sleep, if I ever rest, and I don't rest much, which is great until it lands you here. In 2012, I had been flying nonstop for months on end. I was dealing with investors who were making my life a living hell. I had signed a merger agreement with a CEO I didn't even like. I got off my plane from San Francisco, checked myself into the hospital, and I remained there for three days. I thought that I was having a heart attack, but I was just stressed beyond belief. I had no balance in my life. There was no personal governance. I wasn't taking care of myself, and I was being reckless with my own body. Just like any other engine, your body and mind have limits too. If you push yourself too hard and never let off the gas, you will eventually pop a piston. Governance of your own well-being is job number one as an entrepreneur. And you're the only person who can do it. Not your business partner, not your family, you. It is your job. Because if you die before you succeed, I guarantee you will fail. I've been focused and I've been scattered. If you're gonna build the Death Star to take over the world, you need to make sure that you have 100% of your resources dedicated to completing it. That doesn't mean that you can't pull the plug and start something new or have a little innovation lab on the side, but don't try to start too many things at once. As a small company, as a startup, as an entrepreneur who's trying to get something off the ground, you don't have enough time or money to build multiple Death Stars. All of my biggest failures were because I wasn't focused on them. They were cool ideas and I liked them, but they weren't really my passion. I also didn't go all in on them and I let them linger around way too long. So you need to ask yourself, if it isn't worth your <coughs> undivided attention, why? Why are you putting any effort into it if you're not gonna put all of your effort into it? So following the market is good, right? People always talk about following the market. You wanna be where the market is. You wanna make sure that you're in the right place at the right time. But there's a difference between following the market and buying into the hype machine. So most people don't know this, but I won the lottery once. Now this wasn't a normal lottery. This was a lottery that happened a lot here in Central Florida in particular at the height of the real estate boom. So at the height of the real estate boom, developers would hold these lotteries where you would win a chance to be able to buy a piece of property in their development. 
And all you had to do was show up, put your name in a hat, and come with a cashier's check. So in 2006, I stood in line, I had my cashier's check ready, and I bought a house. I was feeling so awesome after that first lottery win that I went ahead and went in on another lottery six months later, and I bought a condo. So now I had a house that I was living in, I had a house that I had bought for investment, and, then I bought, and I had a house I'd bought, or a condo that I bought for another investment. And at the time, I was looking around and was like, oh my gosh, real estate is going crazy. Like, you can't lose money in real estate. It's off the charts. You guys remember that? It's nuts. Now, at the same time, I have to tell you that, like, in the bottom of my stomach, I was like, something just isn't right. Something isn't right here. This can't continue to go up at, the, at these rates because people just aren't going to be able to afford these homes. And I would see my friends that were, uh, you know, barely employed that were getting credit to buy $250,000 houses. But I made the bets anyway because I bought into the hype. Today, that house and condo are still worth a fraction of what I paid for them. I made two really bad investments because I wasn't making rational decisions. It was about winning the lottery. It wasn't about making sound investments. And I let that frenzy sweep me up as I tried to make a quick buck. And particularly in our space, in technology, in entertainment, you see this all the time. You know, people get really excited about VR, AR. But you know what? People were talking about VR and AR 20 years ago. And if you dumped in a bunch of money at that time, before things were ready, you would have lost your ass. You got to really step back and look at what's going on in the market. So the same thing happened here. We used to have a platform called Social Spark. And I saw everything that was happening at the time with Groupon and Living Social and the deal space. Remember when the deal space was like huge and everyone was talking about that stuff? So I got caught up in those pre-IPO and I decided that we were going to develop our own deals platform. We were going to create an extension of this, uh, of Social Spark that was focused on deals. But I never really paid, to the under, paid attention to the underlying economics of what that meant for the people that we served in our platform, both the creators and the advertisers on the other side. And you know what? When I step back and look at it, it didn't really fit into our overall strategy either. You know, deals was focused on largely small businesses, and our clients have always been you know, Fortune 1000 companies. But it was all about that hype, right? Like, it just seemed like it was everywhere. It seemed like you couldn't lose money. It was a failure because I did it for the wrong reasons. I bought into the hype machine because it seemed like I couldn't lose. So if a market seems too good to be true, it likely is. I've been protective and I've been presumptuous. I had an employee that I trusted who stole small sums of money from me, from me uh, over a year and a half period. I had a salesperson who completely falsified their pipeline. After we parted ways, we found out that the people that uh, he said he was making proposals for didn't even exist. I had a director at my agency who I trusted to build out a remote office and conspired with the contractor to steal $30,000 in the build-out process. And an employee attempt to sue one of my managers for sexual harassment and later found out that they had done that at their previous job. I had an investor that killed a financing behind my back so that he could strike a better deal with me. I had an employee who told me that they had cancer 
so that they could take sick days, only to find out later that they never did. 20 years of people. But I am still the eternal optimist. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. But as an entrepreneur, you also need to make sure that you have the controls in place and that you don't just trust blindly. A little bit of skepticism is healthy. You need to make sure that you have people earn your trust. I've been grateful and I've been greedy. In 2006, I turned down an offer to buy one of my companies that I had founded. I put seven years into building it and I thought that it was worth a lot more than one time's revenue. After I left that company to start another one, the revenue started to decline. Then the recession hit, and sadly, it never recovered. So while the investors got paid some dividends along the way, that company never really had its big exit. And it was all because I was simply too greedy for my own good. A few years later, I had another acquisition offer for another company. And that package had a good deal of compensation built into it for me personally, because that company wanted me to stay with uh, the company after the acquisition. So some of the backers in that deal thought that it was too rich for me personally, uh, even though that they would have made some, some good money on it, they wanted a higher multiple for themselves. So they decided that I was conflicted and they took me out of the negotiation. That deal eventually blew up and not too many months later, management bought out those VCs for penny on, pennies on the dollar. Sometimes a double is better than waiting for a grand slam. And I have to tell you guys that I see this all the time with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs always think that their company is worth more than it likely is. And at the end of the day, it is only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. I've seen lots of companies that have gone from being worth millions or even hundreds of millions to zero. But perhaps the hardest part of running the red line is the constant battle between failure and defeat. Every entrepreneur fights an army of no's throughout their career. When you're starting up, your family will tell you no. Your friends will tell you no. Your potential customers will tell you no. The no's are your biggest hurdle. Whether it's a failed prototype or a no from an investor, the no's hurt. Failure hurts. We all see the stories of the successful people that make it look so easy, and we wonder why it's so hard for us. It's easy to feel like the struggle is yours and yours alone, but you're not alone. Some of the greatest people in history suffered much defeat before they found success. Steven Spielberg was denied admission to film school. Jack Dorsey was ousted as CEO of Twitter, then rehired. Ariana Huffington was rejected by 36 book publishers. Even the ladies man was rejected by 2,400 ladies. The struggle is real. But it's also part of the journey. I'm depressed as shit. I hate my job. 
investors have just completely fucked me over. And I don't know if I want to go back to work on Monday. just don't know. That was from a few years ago. During my worst epic shitstorm. I have been through hell and back over the past 20 years with my various companies. I've almost filed for bankruptcy. I've had the lights turned off at the office. I've skipped paychecks. I've personally funded payrolls. I've had days where it felt like the end of the world. But despite my worst days, I have never quit. Not when the industry attacked me, not when the VCs gave up on me, not when the bankers told me that they couldn't get me funded. I got my ass out of bed, focused my efforts, and took another swing. And you know what? It took some time, but you can't be defeated if you never give up. You never give up. You never give up. You never give up. Like my son, most companies and ideas are born premature. It is scary, it is touch and go, it requires constant attention, it is emotional, it is draining, but if you get through the early days, there is a long, happy future ahead. All the no's, all the doubt, all the pain, it is all worth it. If you keep pushing and rebound from defeat, you will eventually get the yes. Baby! We just got commitments for $11 million! You will get over the hump, and you will do epic shit. Thank you. <laughs> Guess I want to open it up for any questions. Do we want him to repeat the question or? Yeah. I can repeat the question. Yep. My name is Ira Forrester. I'm in the entertainment business program, uh, Bachelors of Science. I just wanted to ask you, has there ever been a time when intellectual property was really a critical factor for you to move forward because you owned it? And has there ever been a time when you missed something about something uh, that was your intellectual property and it held you back? Yes. Yeah, so you know, a core, biz a core part of our business today is the platform that we have built. It's the, it's the technology um, that enables these transactions between creators and, and brands, and that's really what gives our, our company a competitive edge. At the same time, I think that 
um, when you're talking about intellectual property, a lot of people are often talking about you know having having patents on on a software or hardware, and that has gotten to be very difficult in um, really in the past year. Uh, there's been some cases that have been passed that have made it near impossible to get a software patent, uh, especially around processes now. Um, I also, I don't necessarily believe that a patent in itself is what makes a great business. Uh, it really comes down to scale and being able to provide value to your customers on one side or, or the other. Uh, you know, if you look out in the marketplace right now, there are a number of, of in any category, you'll look at, at someone who may be the perceived leader, and then there's 20 knockoffs of, of that leader, right? Um, you look at someone like uh, eBay, right? The biggest auction marketplace, it doesn't mean that there's, a, there's only one out there doing online auctions. The, the reason that people go there is because they have all the buyers and they have all the sellers. Uh, it's not necessarily even that they have the best, best software. Um, so I believe that the, the way that you truly keep your competitive edge long term is that you have to provide value for the customers. People are always going to try to knock off your software. They're going to make a little tweet that gets a, a tweak that gets around your, uh, your IP, um, and they'll be able to go around you. And uh, I, I don't think that it's defensible long term. You know, what, what, what uh, IP laws are great for is attorneys. They make a ton of money off that, right? Uh, and um, at the end of the day, I don't think that that's how you win as, as a business. Um, unless you have something really spectacular that is a, you know, a physical product, uh, is hardware-based, um, I don't think in the software world that, that it matters very much. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever's easier for you guys to pass the. <laughs> hi there. Hello. Oh, hi, Ted. How are you doing today? Great. My name is Patrick. I'm a web design development student here. My question for you is, do you have an idea of what your next move is? Yes, but if I told you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, when I think about my future and what I might like to, to do next, I've been doing this web-based stuff for, for a while now, you know, almost 20 years, um, and I love it. Uh, but, you know, if I look beyond Isaiah, um, which I'm still, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, investors. I love you guys. Um, it might be something that's actually more physical and tangible. Um, you know, I really like working with my hands. I like the creative process. I, I get my most, the most of my joy out of woodworking in my garage over the weekends. And, um, you know, I think that at some point, if I decide to ever step away from this, it might be something that is a little bit more um, tangible, you know, and something that I can touch and feel. Uh, um, but I'm far from, far from looking at that. Um, my name is Sakon Patpra Yulat. I from uh, entertainment business. I from Thailand too. And I love Thailand. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I like the way that you say it. everyone say no, 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 no all the time. And then I think that so when we're gonna be ready. And my question is, uh, when when you are consider yourself as an entrepreneur. And is it necessary to work with someone or some company before I establish my own company or jump off as an entrepreneur? I think that, that that's different for everyone. I think that it, it comes down to what are your skill sets and where are your areas of weakness. The, the biggest mistake that I see entrepreneurs make is that they may be fantastic engineers, or they may be fantastic content creators, but they are not great business people, and they are not great salespeople. 
And my primary role as an entrepreneur is I am selling. I am selling my ass off every single day. I'm selling to customers. I'm selling to investors. I'm selling to my own team because I got to go and recruit the people that are going to do all, all of the work and make this company great. And if that is not a skill set that you possess or one that comes naturally to you, you may not you may not be the person who should be the entrepreneur. Maybe somebody else should step in and be that, be that CEO um, and, and be the guy who's the leader and you're the technical right-hand man or whatever it, whatever it may be. Um, but I, I think that a lot of people make the mistake of like, oh, I'm a great inventor, but I'm, but I'm not necessarily an, an entrepreneur. And those are things that you can also learn by working inside of another organization. Um, you know, if, if you don't have sales chops, but you have a desire to be an entrepreneur, I would say that I would go and, and, you know, get a job as an inside salesperson at an organization and then cut your teeth there and see what that's like and see what it's like to actually build up a sales team. Because I don't care what the hell your product is. If you can't sell it, you are going to fail. doesn't matter how great it is. Uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs have made a ton of money actually selling inferior products because they're fantastic at selling on, on the other side and they can market the hell out of it. And the best companies at the end of the day have fantastic products with an awesome sales and marketing organization. And that's what you should strive for. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tevin Green. I'm in the music business program. And my question for you is, when you're starting up your company, how did you, or can you give advice on how did you uh, lure your customers in or uh, get investors to believe in your um, your business? Yep. I mean, I, I think I spoke a little bit about this um, in the beginning of the talk today is at first, we didn't make a lot of, we didn't make a lot of money. You know, it was re it's really hard to get your first customers because nobody wants to go first. You know, anytime you go in and you're trying to sell a, a product or a service to someone, they always say, well, show me what else you've worked on. And so it's this chicken and, and egg where it's like, well, I don't have anything to work on yet, but I, how about you're that person? And they're like, oh, I don't want to be that person. Um, so at first you have to, you have to, be willing to give it away and to work on the on the cheap in order to build up that portfolio so that you can kind of you know work up to the next level and so when i was in in college and i was doing free work or was doing stuff on trade actually when i say free i never give stuff away for free i will do stuff for trade right so you want to you want to give me your sandwiches and I'll do your design work? Fantastic, right? Um, the, I, would, I would do that stuff in exchange for food in the beginning. And then the next customer I went to, they, did, they didn't have any idea that I was working for food over here. Um, I just went in and said, look at this great work I've been, I've been doing. And I just kind of built the portfolio from, from there. Um, you know, those those people are also going to be the ones that are going to be your best source of business. So you do that work for that initial uh, that initial client, and if you do a great job for them, they're going to tell their their friends, and then you start referrals. Uh, because when you're when you're starting off, and you don't have a lot of of capital. That's going to be your absolute best set uh, source of um, of sales right, is those warm leads that come from uh, people that say that you do a great job. All right, thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Nick Golden. I'm in the uh, simulation and visualization program here, and um, I'm actually working on a startup to produce my own VR HMDs. Okay. And. Um, the long-term goal is basically to use them to disrupt the pharmaceutical industry. So I guess if you were in my position, would you come out basically swinging at big pharmacy or would you kind of keep that under wraps? 
You know, I, I love the idea that you actually, you have a focus, because I talk to a lot of people who are just like, I'm, you know, I'm doing some cool stuff in AR and VR, and it's like, all right, well, how are you gonna make money? And it's, it's just really cool stuff. You should see what I, I can do. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would focus all of my effort on that. And, and um, you know, I would, I would try to break into that as, quick, as quickly as I possibly can and kind of establish yourself as the guy who does stuff for that space. Uh, because uh, everyone is investing in, in AR and VR now. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, but I would say that most people are focused on, um, you know, entertainment and, uh, you know, sports and, and, you know, physical, men, melding that with physical attractions, things like that. I, ha I don't think I've ever heard anyone who's like, yeah, I'm going to focus on, on pharma. Because uh, it's probably, you know, it's the least sexy of, of all those things. Um, but it's probably where a lot of money is also to, to be made. So I would, I would absolutely do that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, in, in our early days, one of the things that we realized was that going after um, non-sexy niches was the easiest way for us to get sales because you didn't have everybody and their mother calling on those those clients. So our agency, like one of the ways that we got out of losing all those big brands was that we were like, you know what, let's let's start to, to target people that our competitors aren't, aren't going after because everybody wants the Burger King and the Taco Bell. And you know, if you're an agency, it's like, oh, those are the cool, fun, sexy brands to work on. But we went after like Tyco um, and, and we were doing, you know, design work for like gauze bandages <laughs> and it wasn't this it wasn't sexy stuff but it you know what they they paid their bills and we were able to to grow that into a huge account for us so Well, first of all, thank you, Ted, for sharing that with us and for being so transparent and open about your journey and the fact that it's not all rainbows and unicorns being an entrepreneur and there are going to be downsides to it, too. Um, before we started, you and I talked a little bit about some of the new things that are going on at Isaiah. So I was wondering if you could share those and maybe first talk a little bit more about what Isaiah does. <laughs> what do we actually do? So we, we have a platform that allows brands to pay creators uh, to do really one of two things. Either they're going to produce content for them, that's uh, text, photos, videos, uh, or they are going to do a sponsored social post. So they're going to do a post on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, a blog or YouTube. Um, so our platform really facilitates that happening at scale and provides all of the workflow tools and measurements for, for the advertiser. Um, what we just announced last week uh, was an expansion of our, our platform, our new iOS app, our, our um, new Android app. Isaiah Pay, which makes it really easy for brands to, to compensate creators, because a lot of times it's hard for them, just given these small transactions, to get these people set up as vendors. And uh, also some new Facebook integrations and some performance-based uh, tools from, for the marketers as well. Great. Well, thank you again. We certainly appreciate you being here. We appreciate Isaiah being a sponsor. Thanks to all of you who are here and who are watching online. Um, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have another show after this, so if you don't mind gathering.